This is an audio recording of the Lendit Fintech Weekly News Show. The show is streamed live on Lendit TV, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter at 5 p.m. Eastern Time every Thursday. In this fast-paced show, the Lendit News team and a special guest discuss the most important fintech news stories of the past week. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Lended Fintech Weekly News Roundup. My name is Peter Renton, Chairman and Co-Founder of Lended Fintech, coming at you actually from our New York office today. I've been visiting New York this week, first time in a long time, but I'm joined by uh, my good friend and colleague, Todd Anderson. How are you doing, Todd? I'm good, Peter, from the Long Island office, so not too far away from you. but <laughs> yes. yes, the Long Island home office. And then Dan Kwan, our good friend. How are you doing, Dan? Doing great. Thank you, Peter, for uh, inviting me back. I'd love to come back okay. over and over again. <laughs> always. It's always a pleasure to have you. So just give, give, give us a 20-second intro um, to, to you and your, and your company, your new company. Well, it's not new anymore. So yeah, I'm Dan Kwan, um, uh, co-founder and a general partner of a new venture firm called the Nevco Ventures. We are uh, investing in fintech, uh, mostly fintech, but also looking to other sectors adjacent. Right. Okay, well, let's kick it off. Um, Lots of news this week. We are going to start, though, with um, Venmo. Everyone knows Venmo um, and uh, Amazon. So Amazon has never never accepted Venmo. It's never accepted PayPal. Um, obviously, they're competitors. But um, this week, Amazon announced they are going to add a Venmo checkout option next year. Um, it's going to be uh, on the in the browser on the app. Um, PayPal is still not going to be an option, but uh, but Venmo is clearly this is coming from Amazon's customers who are saying they really want to pay by Venmo. But uh, it's you know it's PayPal sort of. They're getting in the door now with Amazon, which I thought was a was a super interesting development. And uh, you know, Venmo has eighty million um, U.S. consumers, and uh, everyone I know has a Venmo <laughs> has a Venmo account. But um, what do you guys think? Is this uh, what what does this portend? Anything? You want to go first, Tyler? Or you want me to go first? You go for it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think th- this announcement probably came in at the right moment when. When uh, you know PayPal are, has already been dropped by eBay, which is not a surprise, right? This is something has been in making for a number of years. Yep. So this will be a, a nice way for them to uh, uh, hope, hopefully gain some gain back some revenue. But I think it's really interesting to see that Amazon allows Venmo but not PayPal. I guess you know I don't know I don't have any inside information, but I'm I have to guess probably Venmo charges a lower fee right. um, than PayPal. And the other thing is. Uh, um, Amazon probably also looks at it as a, a sort of uh, uh, a mobile first um, um, move because um, uh, you, you have to use a, your mobile app to pay for uh, your Amazon purchases using Venmo. So I think there's it's definitely good news for for PayPal. Um, um, I, I just there's one thing that I'm just not sure about is that uh, we talked about this right before the show. You know, uh, PayPal price actually share price dropped like ten percent right after the earnings announcement and they blame a bunch of factors and eBay being one of such uh, factors. Um, I don't know how much of this, this they're going to make up for it. And uh, for Venmo, this is definitely definitely positive news because PayPal has really been trying to uh, make this uh, uh, monetize uh, the, the Venmo service so far. You know, they have got debit card, the credit card, but I think mm-hmm. the segment probably is still losing money. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> to me, I think the, you know, the more fascinating angle to the story is not necessarily the the partnership but just what's happening in the payment space uh now for so long it was dominated by you know visa mastercard and and now you have all these different payment mechanisms that are uh you know when you think of it i wonder if the the bigger thing for the venmo thing is that you know for those that sell through amazon are they getting uh you know, hit too hard with other fees from Visa, MasterCard. I mean, the the fees coming down all across the board in payments, I think, is the more interesting thing. And how rails are basically going around Visa, MasterCard uh, by now, pay later, uh, famously, 
you know, not using Visa or MasterCard Rails. So to me, I think the broader payment space is really, really fascinating right now. Um, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, a very interesting tie up with the two companies, but I think the broader what's happening in payments uh, and how the fees and, and the rails are being constructed is, is really the, the more interesting part to me right now. And I think it's the next five years, the whole payments ecosystem is, is going to be vastly different from what we see today. Yep. And we haven't even mentioned crypto and uh, well, yeah. yeah, that, I mean, Venmo, um, you know, you obviously PayPal offers crypto trading. I think Venmo has some uh, crypto. I'm not exactly sure what, uh, can't remember exactly what Venmo offers when it comes to crypto, but PayPal is certainly bullish on crypto and that, you know, it doesn't make much, doesn't take much to, for Venmo to say, right, you can just um, use your crypto to pay on Amazon now. That, uh, well, I'm not sure if anyone wants to pay with crypto these days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's the pay- crypto has been a good investment. That's for sure. I think, they, <laughs> for sure. They, I think they would rather pay for crypto to say they paid with crypto versus like it being a real option to, to, yeah. you know, to seem cool at this moment. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting what's going on there. It's and, um, and probably just want to just, you know, we, we a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the Ma- uh, MasterCard offering buy now pay later. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is definitely not, they're using their existing rails and partnerships to offer, to make that option available to their partners. Not, not, not so, so they don't have to go through the very, you know, extensive integration with merchants individually. Uh, they can just go through a massive rail. So this is also really further proof that uh, the payment space is going through a uh, significant uh, disruptions in the next couple of years. Yep. Yeah. Okay. We need to move on. Um, Robin Hood, uh, they were in the news earlier this week, not in a good way. There's been a data breach. It happened on November 3, which I guess is uh, eight days ago. And um, they had, you know, it seems like, you know, there's 5 million uh, email addresses that were obtained. 2 million of those had full names as well. And so I don't know how it's kind of weird. 310 people had more complete data stolen no no social security numbers no bank data but you know address date of birth that sort of thing from 310 people hopefully i hopefully you have to get lucky to be in that group of millions yeah millions. very so, weird yeah. reporting of the, the it was families. it was it was it was strange but you know robin hood came clean right away did uh you know didn't seem like it affected them too much but um they uh looks like they've they've nipped it in the bud pretty quickly I mean, you know, cybersecurity, this is the, you know, as fast as fintech is innovating the, you know, the dark web or criminals, whatever area you want to bucket them into is innovating just as fast. Uh, and so it, the battle for data, it's funny. I think we, Pete, Peter, I think we recently did a, um, a webinar or a podcast talking about, um, you know, the, the data that the companies, whether it be lenders, payments, banks, whatever have the bad guys are having almost the equivalent of that set of data these days. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like a battle of data with good intentions and bad intentions. And, you know, I I don't think there's any easy answer. I mean, it's just you companies are going to have to keep innovating and protecting themselves. You know, we've seen this many times with banks. It's it's an arms race, right? That's never going to end. And I I don't know whether are we, are we sort of in this sort of data breach fatigue now? Like, (laughs) <laughs> you hear, you hear like, Maybe. hey, there's data breach. Okay, okay, so, okay, so what's the big deal, right? I, I open my phone and uh, I, I, you know, iPhone would just suggest me suggest that, hey, this this app was breached. You know, your name, your address probably was stolen or in the, in the batch. You should consider changing it. Um, you know, I don't know. And I think the, I, <laughs> this story actually cracked me up a little bit. Uh, uh, there's one one part of the story where. Uh, uh, Robin Hood said uh, someone, the hacker, socially engineered a customer support employee by phone. Yeah. To, yeah. How did that happen? You know. So this is this is you know. Well, that was they're, true. They're, yeah. Like that's 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 what that's what these guys do. I mean, they get you. You start to you get a you, on a phone with a customer service engineer, and you go, "Hey, hey, can I can I just send you this quick email?" Or, or you go just say, "Hey, I've got a." Or you start chatting with them and you've got a photo of a dog that they really like. Just go, why don't you open up the photo of a dog I have? And boom, you're in. Yeah. And well, uh, they, they, they probably should do more uh, employee training in the first yes. place. Yes. Yes. No, they, they, they 
they should. But uh, I do think your point about the fatigue is, you know, is is somewhat of a, you know, it's a bad thing because it is. if we're not, you know, attuned to that this is a big deal, then it becomes less and less of a big deal. And then our eyes are only opened when it's 100 million accounts stolen instead of seven. I think either way, fintech, the industry generally should be very cognizant of what happened here. You know, they, they other executives should be talking to Robin Hood, you know, kind of just off the record. And, hey, you know, how can we better understand this? I mean, this is something where the community should be coming together to protect themselves, because ultimately, if Robin Hood can get hacked, the chances are some other wealth Anyone manager or digital bank can get hacked. So. Okay, let's move on. I want to talk about uh, an article from Penny Crossman um, this week. I think it was Monday, uh, talking about uh, obviously Penny Crossman, American banker, talking about stable coins and being um, you know, the, the, the whole the president's um, working group um, from Treasury released a report, working group on financial markets, stable coin report that came out last week, and. Yeah, Penny has a really good, really good article here, just talking about whether or not, you know, who should be, is it fair that the FDIC goes and, and says they want to, they want to be only, you know, that they want to make sure that stable coins are only issued by FDIC insured banks. Really interesting um, commentary from um, Caitlin Long from Avanti, who's, uh, she's applying for FDIC insurance in response to this, uh, to this report <laughs> on stable coins. But then you've got, you know, then you've got the state saying, hang on, I don't think that's fair because NYDFS, they, they are already regulating some of the top stablecoin issuers. You've got Circle, Paxos, Gemini, all in New York. Um, so then you've got other states doing different things. You know, Wyoming, obviously, Nebraska, uh, Illinois, there's different. So there's a bit of a, there, there's, there's some turf tension. War. Yes, a turf there's war. some tension about who can get in the way the most. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I, I, about regulators, I mean, regulators have their role. And, and Dan, you know, I know you used to be, um, you know, in the CFPB. Um, but I just think it's like the the change from the last four years, even to now. Uh, it's like there we've gone away from, hey, there's a sensible middle path here. It's like we have to jump from one extreme to the other. And, you know, the the saddest part about all this is you have so many companies out there that want to talk to regulators, that want to work with them and create the boundaries with them. And this current stance is not helping. I think it's hurting so many companies. And then, you know, think of the cascading effects. It's going to hurt the next company that says, oh, I was thinking of this idea, but I'm not going to do it now because, you know, they're going to eventually regulate me out of business. So, you know, I think there needs to be some sense of, hey, we need to come together as federal state um, regulators and say, hey, how do we encourage innovation in a safe way? Because right now, the turf war, the overregulation, taking all these stances, it's like I said, I think it was a month ago. Europe's going to slide right past us. And us in China are doing the same thing in different ways, but, you know, quashing an entire industry. Well, not um, yet. We're not doing not, it yet. Not we're yet. We're, we're on to. that path. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, so, so my, I have a bunch of really, bunch of really unanswered questions, right? So how big is this market, right? We're talking about, what well, I don't know, 200 billion, 300 billion dollars. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. it's sizable. It's lots of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it is tiny. So are we, really do we really want to pull a bazooka to kill this little you know fly that's number one number two what's the purpose of fdic insurance right so you give a dollar you give your bank a dollar the bank actually doesn't take the dollar and put it in a safe you know safe box actually the bank actually you know this french banking they actually lend out the dollar um and uh, that's why you want some kind of assurance from the government that if the bank goes under because of bad lending practices your money is still safe with stablecoin, do we really need that, right? So it's a, small, it's a small market, still growing very fast, but still small. And not to mention, and you guys also mentioned that these guys are, you know, Circle and the Paxo, these guys are regulated by, by states. Are we basically saying the states are doing, their, doing a bad job? So most of the horror stories we are talking about stablecoins are really about Tether, 
frankly, right? It's right. Heather that right. no really transparency in how they actually, you know, whether they have a reserve or how much the reserve they actually have created to to uh, to back the the uh, the uh, um, their tokens. So um, I I just don't get it, frankly. And I, I'm not against FDIC insurance agencies uh, institutions to to issue stablecoin. I think that's fine. But there's really so far, as far as I can tell, there's no there's there's there, nobody can convince me that states are are really you know letting this train. Uh, you know, train wreck to happen without really exercising their their oversight to ensure you know these guys are not cheating their customers. Yeah, yeah. No, it's and then this this one last thing before we move on. Interesting that um, the Cato Institute, Penny, uh, talked to talk to them and they... Norbert. Yeah, Norbert is uh, is new, and uh, you know, haven't I actually haven't met Norbert yet? But we are going to actually uh, uh, meet virtually, unfortunately, next week. Right. Well, anyway, they're saying that, it's, that, that actually stablecoin issuers should be regulated as limited purpose investment companies overseen by the SEC. So there's, a, there's another whole whole different uh, type of regulation there. But anyway, we need to move on. I want to talk about Secure, the largest funding round this week, $450 million at a $4.5 billion valuation, $40 billion valuation. Normally that would be massive news, of course, these days. That's just another funding round that we, <laughs> we talk about. But I do, you know, the, the thing about Secure is that I think they're really interesting. They've got 12 of the top 15 banks. Now it's, it's all about, you know, identity verification, anti-fraud type type things. And, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've been a supporter here at Lendit for a while and, you know, they're doing, they're doing really well. And they got not just 12 of the top 15 banks, they got a whole bunch of fintechs and SoFi is uh, uses Secure and they're, um, you know, they're a company that we don't talk about much, but uh, they're another rocket ship. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the other, Big thing, especially with you know the the crypto world and and you know interspersing with the regular financial world, the digital identity is only going to become bigger and bigger, and verifying who people are through efficient technology is, you know, there's there's more need now than ever before, and companies like Secure do it in such a slick way that it's you know kind of makes the onboarding process pretty seamless. Uh, yeah, and, and I think it's, that's and especially huge. If, yeah, and especially if you know, think about this 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 during this pandemic, how how pos- is it possible for you to even open a account like in person in a branch, right? That's just that's just impossible and uh, or virtually impossible. That's why I think I, I mean the, the number is still astonishing. Twelve of the large, you know, fifteen top banks are using their 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 uh, solution to uh, to uh, to uh, uh, without uh, identity. Uh, to verify identity, and one of the things they said in their press release that uh, really caught my eye, they said they their goal is to verify 100% of good identities and completely eliminate identity fraud. Wow, that's a uh, that's a big that's, goal. That's a big <laughs> yeah. goal. Yeah, I'm not saying you reach average 100. That's really huge. Remember a couple couple months ago, so uh, not so far, uh, Chime got into uh, you know some 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 issues where um, some of the customers actually legit customers. Lost access to their to their yep. uh, account yep. because they were deemed as uh, fraud, but they actually are not. Yeah. I mean, just yep. think how complicated the banks are. I mean, within one bank, you have like fifty-seven different divisions, and all those different customers needing to be verified. I mean, so Cure is one of the best, that's for sure. Yep. Yep. Anyway, let's move on. I want to talk about Coinbase. Uh, Coinbase. Um, well, that's what we're going to do in the last for the last peg segment of news. We got, we're going to talk about earnings because there's been a lot of earnings. We could spend the whole whole half hour talking about earnings, but I want to switch into um, some of the major companies that released earnings this week. Coinbase was one of them. They, you know, this if you if you think back to the third quarter, um, you know, six weeks ago or thereabouts, you know, it was. The crypto was kind of going sideways. It wasn't a huge, wasn't a whole lot happening, um, and so they had their trading volume was down, and so their revenue was down, down a lot. Um, but I think they're going to find their Q4 volume is going to be up because crypto is crazy right now. So, but yeah. they still, you know, I look at these numbers: revenue of one point three billion, EBITDA of six hundred and eighteen million. They just know how to print money at Coinbase. It seems uh, monthly users dropped a little, but you know they've. Yeah, you know, they're 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 a behemoth in the fintech space. Yep, and they are. Yeah, I mean, that's 
there's probably I can't think of one or two others that you'd rather go to to trade crypto than Coinbase. Uh, yeah, the, the safest kind of transactions they, they they provide the speed, the the the, the UI experience. It's it's all awesome. So I think, do, do you think, Peter, I think there's just so much sort of, you know, obviously when you, when you're publicly, publicly traded, you know, uh, Wall Street is really on the, on the quarterly horizon, you know, they don't, they don't go beyond um, three or six months. That's, that's sort of unfortunate. Um, and the next quarter, as you mentioned, this, you know, crypto is green, going crazy. Bitcoin, Ether hit a record high recently. So uh, yeah. the number is going to look very, very good um, in Q4. Uh, I think it's, probably going to just uh, take a really some time. I don't know how long it's going to take, maybe two years, maybe five years, maybe 10 years for the, uh, I think when crypto, I mean, crypto is becoming mainstream, but when crypto becomes really like a mainstream, just like, you know, people are comfortable trading cryptos as, as they are, you know, doing with, um, you know, stocks, ETFs and, and the bonds. I think at that time we will have pretty stable, you know, a stable customer base and also more normal, you know, trading activities, which should be relatively independent of the ups and downs of the crypto prices. But right. that's going to take some time. It will take some time. And then the other thing is they got an NFT platform that they, they I think they announced it in the last, uh, in the last month or so. But I was listening to a podcast with Brian Armstrong, the CEO, um, just a couple of days ago, and he, he, he basically said he thinks the NFT platform could be could end up being bigger yeah, so a bigger revenue generation than than the than than crypto and crypto just generated 1.31 billion dollars in revenue in one quarter so it's it's a big business and yeah uh, the, the, the nft is, part is is it's fascinating what that space can potentially be i still think we're years away from it getting to where crypto is today oh yeah, yeah for sure. I, it's yeah, and, and I think that's to me the, the more fascinating part. We just watched crypto basically do this, and now it it's you know it, it's been pretty steady this year. It's had drops, but you know back uh, a few years ago it was kind of wildly up, wildly down, and it has swings now, but not nearly as bad. But yeah, the NFT space and and what they're doing in the NFT space is going to be very very interesting. Yeah. Considering how hard NFTs are to really uh, you know, to buy for the most part, like OpenSea is still not very user friendly. They're they're making money hand over fist, and I think Coinbase has the yeah has has a huge user base. And I think it's going to be big. But anyway, let's move on to a firm. A firm um, reported earnings. They uh, revenue two hundred and sixty nine million, pretty solid. Beating analyst expectations, guided up higher for 320, 330. This is this quarter, obviously, the holiday season. They're expecting to do a bit more. Um, but the stock went really up for the most part on the news about Amazon because basically what it was is a firm. We all we already heard about this, this, this partnership, but basically they're going to be exclusive BNPL for Amazon this Christmas season and next Christmas season. And that was uh, that was news to to investors so boom they had a nice a nice bump i think the the more interesting thing i think and peter i think we were talking about this the other day in the office was what happens after you know bnpl has boomed this year christmas season's coming up you know will bnpl be such a part of christmas season that that is where it encounters issues and on the back side of it you know, the, the regulators come in and, um, you know, look at the, the areas, which obviously so it, in some cases need to be looked at more standardized reporting and stuff like that. Like, will it, by the time we get to next Christmas, will the rules kind of be written for BNPL? I don't know. Mm. I, I think it's fascinating to see because we haven't really seen a, a huge story. Like I, I went into you know massive debt because of this. I didn't understand the product I was using. Yeah, I mean, just the, the last week there was a congressional hearing on buy now pay later. Um, well, they, they call it buy now pay more later. <laughs> That's the title <laughs> of the of the, uh, of the hearing. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, concerns about. Listen, I mean, um, I, I so I, I some people actually equate us to the uh, the mortgage crisis we, that we, we went through ten years ago, right? But this is different, right? So. Yes. In terms of scale, in terms of the impact on the on the economy on the uh, on the whole, and also, you know, if if these BNPL companies are irresponsible, meaning they are really not doing 
you know, they're not really lending money to the, to the right people. People really cannot really pay back. At the end of the day, they are actually going to suffer the consequences. Investors yep. are going to lose their money. So they're going to go under. So, and I think if you want to be smart, you got to do the check that you have to check, right? So, which is, which is underwriting. Um, and I think uh, I just saw the, uh, the there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, I don't know if it's a press release or some kind of reporting uh, um, uh, when Mascar talked about their BNPL um, play. So they are actually getting lots of traction with, you know, Fifth Thirds, Synchrony, and uh, SoFi, and uh, and some 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 other banks in in, in Australia and elsewhere. Um, they are actually talking about using um, their 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 access through open banking to consumer checking accounts, so that they mm -hmm. can actually do the you know a decent ability to repay check. So I think that's really I believe that's where the industry is going, and I I haven't seen any sort of a big sort of number that 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 that, that said to me that hey you know there's a there's an increasing amount of debt that people cannot pay back. And as a result, this, this, is, uh, this is bad for consumers. I think there's still a lot of good things that the BNPL can bring. Yeah, I agree. And the thing is, the debt is just not that high because like most of these ticket sizes are low. You know, after pay, you, you, it's usually like $2,000 is their max, I believe. Um, you know, that, you add up all the BNPLs and you probably still get a lower loan amount than, than the average Lending Club or Prosper loan. I would guess. Right. But anyway... Move on. Moving on to SoFi, also reported this week, uh, revenue two hundred and seventy-two million, up significantly, thirty-five percent year over year. I think that's interesting about SoFi. I mean, they continue to add new members. Lending is still so much a part of their business. Their revenue is two seventy-two. Their lending revenue, two hundred and ten. So the vast majority, eighty percent of what they're doing is is still lending related. Now SoFi is. They've got their name on a football stadium. They, they, they are trying to, you know, do crypto trading and stock investing and, and debit cards and what have you, but lending is still where it's at for them. It's funny, the, they, the lending thing, sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was going to say the, the only comment I want to make was they bought a bank and their earnings look very much like a bank. <laughs> <laughs> lending is is what leads the way. And you know, they have all these other products, but lending is the most profitable part of what they do. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think SoFi has done a fantastic job in really sort of... Um, you know, they started as a student loan refi business, right? But yep. uh, if you look at their, their lending volume, their student loan refi accounted for probably... I mean, the level of the lending probably student loan refi was then less than half of the pre-pandemic level. Right. So a lot of the, uh, you know, business is is going to you know credit cards and the personal loans and and uh, and and the mortgages. So that's really a good job they did. And the other thing is just the their ability to add uh, add new customers. Um, it, it's it's still quite astonishing because you know so far it's no longer a a uh, a startup. It's a it's a it's a publicly traded very, very mature business. But they're adding. I think just on this in this quarter, on average, forty two hundred new members every day, right? Which is like you know three hundred seventy seven thousand, um, and the number was higher than than the last quarter. Last quarter, probably we're talking about probably you know up to three thousand a day. So that, that that growth is really astonishing, and uh, the ability for SoFi to really cross sell their products. And I think the crypto trading definitely is. You know, I'm personally you know I'm a SoFi user, and I know how easy it is to use their app to 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 trade to trade cryptos or, or buy stocks fractional shares it's just so easy for people to do so i'm not yeah. surprised at all they are able to cross sell their products to to their users mm -hmm. okay so last but definitely not least we have upstart they have been a rocket ship this year and they had uh, another uh, i mean it was a solid quarter 228 million dollars of revenue above expectations they they're solidly profitable um, and they, uh, you know, their their stock is up six hundred and seventy percent this year, <laughs> which I don't think anyone would have predicted that at the start of the year because um, that they but people people love them. They've been they've had a bit of a correction in the last uh, couple of weeks, but uh, still still doing well and still you know that's, that is a nice profit margin that uh, they've already got, and you know that I think they continue to execute. And just one other thing, they're starting in small business lending, which I thought was super interesting. Totally surprised me that that, that sort of slipped into uh, the earnings call. 
one question I really have for, 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 for both of you and probably for the audience as well. How, how, if, if you're an investor, how do you value these stocks? Do you value them as financial services stocks? Or do you value them as a you know, technology? It looks at the multiple that uh, these guys are having today, Affirm or SoFi or, or, uh, or Upstart. Especially Upstart, it is not a traditional financial services. Of course, you can't, there's no value. There's no multiple that gets you, gets you there. Yeah, Upstart, I would say, is a technology company, um, and SoFi and and uh, some of the others that we were just talking about, I'd say more financial services. But they're still growing. What they do is yeah. the reason that reason that um, they're still doing well is because they just keep growing adding adding new adding new uh, customers growing revenue much faster than any traditional financial institution does yeah monthly active users all that yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's why i think people are still putting a lot of premium on, on these stocks yeah uh, the party's going to end eventually but um we don't know we don't know where and when that will happen getting early get out at the right time <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly that's great advice dan on that we are gonna we're going to finish it off perfect um, ending Yes, thank you all very much uh, for, for, for watching or listening. Um, we will be back here same time next week. Before we go, though, just a quick reminder, we have our Latin America event happening in, uh, in four weeks, less than four weeks now. Um, really super strong interest in this event. And uh, if you even have a moderate interest in Latin America, you should, you should there. It is in person in Miami. It's going to be a blast. Thanks, guys. Have a good weekend. Thanks. See you, Dan. Thank you, guys. Take care. Yeah.